And <clears throat> I truly believe every human being on the planet longs to feel good. Uh, you can what define good. You can define it a million different ways, but I'll, I'll rephrase that. And say, every human being longs for peace on the inside, longs to not have traffic and rain, longs to lay their head on the pillow with a clear conscience, longs to not feel shame, condemnation, longs to not worry, longs to not be anxious or depressed. It's in our being, in, in our DNA, not to be stressful. That's the longing because for the fall, we know that perfect peace was the portion of humanity. Because we know that God walked in the garden with man. And we know that it was perfect. We know when, obviously, when sin entered the world, confusion set in. And Adam and Eve started doing plan B and sewing up some plants to cover their body and freaking out. And what do we do? And feeling emotions they've never felt before. And I truly believe circumstances are uncontrolled often. What happens around you, you really can't control. How people act, you know, it's often you've heard it said, you can't control what you see or what happens around you, but you can control what's happening within you and how you truly, you, you decide to truly respond. Have you ever read some of those martyrs, the voice of the martyrs, or, or even the Bible, and you're like, how in the world did he do that? Someone would have hit me upside the head. I would have clocked them. That's probably what you've thought in your mind in the past. And how in the world could Stephen stand there and take stones to the head and body, and all of a sudden he's having an open encounter with, with Jesus and, and right before he dies. And it's, as he's dying, he's like, this is awesome. And he's taking rocks, and probably good-sized rocks to the head. And they're just pummeling him. And he's he's not curled up, and, and I like and I say yes, Jesus is for this. How many of you know that the Stephen had the three point stance, if you will, and was going in a direction no boulder, no rock, no persecution was going to stop him because he had set his eyes on Jesus? <clears throat> Circumstances without question oftentimes reveal the character that's with us. You have something that goes wrong, you find out what's happening within you, right? You deal with a physical pain, you find out, do I turn to a bottle of ibuprofen to fix my pain or do I run to him? It gives us an option. Pain gives you option, right? I'm not saying you can't take out the gold, so don't <laughs> Pain gives us an option, and how many of you know, as I was driving in today, we have more options than we ever have had on, on the human planet, ever before. Right? There are more movies out, more series. I'm just using that. I thought of that for an example. My children one day are going to be able to say, well, if I want to, I can gluttonize and watch the, the probably by then, the 45 Avenger movies in the next two weeks. Right? If they want to. I'm not saying it's wrong to watch a movie. But back in our day, we're just hoping the VHS was going to work. And like, I hope, man, that we can get back from the you go rent it, dude. They didn't rewind it, man. I gotta rewind it. Wait ten minutes. Somebody pops some popcorn. You know, you're ticked off, and it's like you're just hoping the tube's gonna work. That that seven thousand pound the TV that you like saved your life up for. Yeah. Now they're giving them away on the side of the street. Yeah. Um, times have changed, and the what a young person has at their fingertips is like never before. We know that. We know that what. Our children are up against, and even you teenagers in here have at your fingertips. It's quite terrifying if if a vision isn't in place, if stewardship isn't in place, if if having an understanding isn't locked in, which is why we've never needed fathers and mothers more than more than before. And I want to define that real quick. Fathers and mothers aren't the voice in the side pecking like a woodpecker in the children's ears. Fathers and mothers model how to be a how to be a man or a woman. Fathers and mothers don't say, you don't get a phone yet, but yet they gluttonize on the phone over here. That's not fathering. That's called, you're still a little kid stuck in an adult's body. Fathers and mothers say, you can't watch this, but yet go, or immoral of what they watch. Right? And so, it's convicting, but it's exciting because the topic at which I'm really hitting on this morning is, is I want, this is a really simple phrase, we need to listen. This just came into my being this week. We need to embrace and learn how to hug adversity and hug our tribe. 
squeeze this like love because otherwise we are not actually living out the Bible. We aren't doing who Jesus created us to be. We end up being a people with language, people with practice, people with quote unquote discipline, might even give a lot, might even do all the things, but we have fortresses around us, and really what we're called are modern day Pharisees if we do that. Disconnected from his presence, to keep everything at bay so we can still live comfortable and, and find a way when we do get cut by the world to just some, somehow numb the pain to continue to go forward. We turn to Hebrews, I'm just going to read it, Hebrews 5, 8. <clears throat> Though he was a son, this is referring to Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. How many of you know that Jesus actually had to learn how to it wasn't like, I'm the son of God, and I'm five years old, and all y'all jokers bow to me. It, it was never that. But do you know that the spirit within him was the same Holy Spirit within us? So the, the revelatory realm that Jesus lived in taught him how to embrace, taught him how to overcome. Because every trial Jesus went and, and experienced before he hung on that day and was persecuted beyond measure that we have zero grid for, took the way of the world on was a preparation. You know, we get frustrated when we get tempted after a day's worth of fasting and you know, you drive by Chipotle or your favorite smell of barbecue or whatever, and you're like, dude, I'm crushing food right now. Jesus was in a desert, probably exhausted, fasting for 40 days, and the devil himself shows up. I don't think we, you know, we got a little this little smell demon coming through into our being, and we're like, I want food, and it's been, I'm shaking, I need food, it's been 12 hours. And Jesus is on day 40, and like, here comes the devil disguised in beauty. Not the little, little, you know, four foot one horned devil, like, ha ha, I'm here. But the beautiful devil that comes to give him beauty and say, Jesus doesn't even think twice about it. And I want us to understand the pressure point that he was experiencing in that moment. It wasn't, Father, why do I have to do this? I could just see his response to the Lord. Father, what in the world? Why are you sending me? I am the son of God, was never, he didn't know what a pity party was. I want to ask you a question. You ever been, your buttons pushed? And you're like, dude, if, if someone says one more thing, like it's about to go down, right? How many of you know that if that is your response, and, and that being me, many a times? Not just a time to check your heart, but a time to say, what is happening within me? Is this is the easiest your life is probably ever going to be. I hate to break it to you, and you're like, I'm going through the ringer. Well, there's days coming where it's going to be catastrophically harder. I'm not prophesying your family life falling apart. It's not, I'm talking globally. What will happen? And what we do right now, and how we model for our children and our grandchildren, the vision that we give them will either be comfort and self-preservation and how can you just live with stuff so you can be at peace and take the, I'm just going to use the, the drug of the world, the pill of the world so that you don't have to feel any pain. How many of you know that ibuprofen doesn't fix things, right? It, not, it, it does, I mean, if you just do a little study on it, it gives it help at times with inflammation, sure, but there is painkillers block pain. That's not always a good thing. You want to know what the source of your pain is so you can actually run right into it. And so, Oftentimes, I would ask us, what is the ibuprofen of your life? Not just I'm talking about a drug of a medicine, but the thing that we are grabbing onto so that we don't have to truly feel. Because if you don't feel, you don't really grow because you never address root systems. You can cut the tree back, and you do that in March, April, May of, in Florida. Guess what happens in August? That sucker is going to be twice the size and full of life. And now, if you're producing bad fruit, your fruit will multiply negatively if you have a bad root system on it. But if your fruit is helpful and healthy, you prune tr back. We know we're not going to go into all that. But I want us to grab onto this concept because if we do, grab onto the understanding of the invitation <laughs> to embrace, just like he says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. You truly say, I'm trusting. And you're, you're choosing. My own understanding says, I'm really angry right now, and that person did me wrong. Right? Or this thing happened. And this shouldn't have happened because I said yes to God and the prophetic word is supposed to go this way. And you're having this my party and I'm going to cry if I want to, right? 
and, and, and truly saying, I'm not going to lean on my own understanding because my life isn't my own. If it isn't your own, that means whatever's coming at you, yes, you could say, well, Satan is the controller of this world. I'm here to say the sovereignty of God is greater than Satan's controlling in the atmosphere. And how many of you know that, that, that God will, I don't, I'm not going to go into a big theological debate on it right now, but circumstances, things take place, and whether you call God allowed it or it's just coincidence or whatever you want to call it, the bottom line is God's not like freaking out on the throne. And, and let's just go to the extreme when there's a tragedy and someone dies suddenly. That's horrible. And I've been around many people that have lost close ones with a blink of an eye and they're gone. And it's like, what do you even begin to do with the trauma of that? But how many of you know that the Father in heaven is not moved on the throne? Like, what do I do? We just lost one. He's not shocked. And so there, whether it's that the greatest extreme tragedy or a global tragedy or... My work's frustrating me right now. I'm being mistreated. Or my friend said this behind me. Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. It's big or small. The response, the, the theme that the Lord is, I truly believe, is wanting us to grab onto is a proper response. And a true leading. Because this will, this will truly cause us to stay in the fire of the Holy Spirit. And stay unmovable. Because circumstances, guys, it's, it's going to hit the fan weekly. You're, someone's going to bug you. Something's going to happen. Your buttons are going to be pushed. I'm here to say Jesus is buttons every day, all the time. Because, or I'll, I'll just let's just step it up. He didn't have any buttons because he just said, "I don't have any rights." So this, there's no little my spot in here. It's my life is not my own. I lay it down, and the Father takes it up, and and, and I I live before Him. And when you don't have any buttons, yeah, you can be like somewhat put in surprise. By things, but in your surprise, your filter is him, not your emotions. Lean not on your own understanding. And that means all of your ways, he says this, all of your ways. Every single time you think a thought, acknowledge it. It has to go through a filter. And if it goes through you and it goes through me, we're in trouble. Well, I can't believe it. I'm calling such and such. I'm going to tell them what they did. And we are going to, I'm just, I got to process and I got to blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, you're going to go vomit. You're feeling someone else can come with you so that you can get a court case of why this person's horrible rather than seeing them through the lens of grace and people hurt people. And there's a little thing in the Bible called forgiveness. And holy smokes, I could have avoided that two-week trial. I'm actually the one that created the trial. Versus, hey, here's the deal. So check this out. Instead of saying, here's the deal, give them Father for they know a lot what you. I don't know about I'm like, take angels, take this stuff off. It's about to go down. And, and I would have had a throat on it. The seeing of the, of the Lord reveals what's in us. And this the real thing that I want to focus on today is that the goal of life, why he put us on the planet, we know is he wants to be with us. He, he wants to make us like him. And we know in physical form we've been made in the image of God. <laughs> There's, there's many reasons why he sent Jesus, why Jesus came. Many reasons. Yes, to say redeem or But also because he wanted a people back to himself. How many of you know when a father and a son are close, mother, daughter, or whatever, or just parents and children, when there's a closeness in the family, whatever mom and dad do, kids do. Even when it's when it's hellious in a family and it's dysfunctional. Whatever mom and dad do, guess what still happens? Kids do the same thing. Dalton said to me three, about a month ago, two months, maybe two months ago. Dad, whatever you do. <laughs> so, yep. So, I said, Lord, help me. I'm going to restrain this thing out. No, that's right. That is an extreme statement. I didn't train him to say that. How many of you know that? He just said it because he just, I'm the apple of Whatever I do, and if I respond negatively, I train him negativity is how you respond under pressure. If I respond in grace on my lips, under pressure, I train him that dialoguing with the Holy Spirit and living before God is the only option. And when I screw up, I repent him, and I teach him what repentance looks like, right? So, 
I'm, not, I'm just going to reference it. James 1, we're very familiar with it. A rejoice, my brethren, when you fall into various trials and tribulations. He actually says the word rejoice. Rejoice. Uh, you ever, you ever like, talk to a friend and you're not feeling it and you're just like, I need you to pray for me. And then they start counseling. You should read your Bible. And you need to go pray and worship right now. And I'm like, I just want to kick and scream. Don't tell me what to do. You know what I'm saying? And it's that person who's type A and they just know how to fix you, but they're right. And you don't want to hear it. And you're just like, dude, like, give me some space. Uh, you know, let me hear it. You know, do something. Just encourage me. Don't tell me I got to go read my, no, I need to read my Bible. But there's something to be said when we learn how to hug the trial. We learn how to hug the adversity. And if it's a, whether it's a trial on paper of this is like catastrophic, we're going through the ringer right now, or you're just irritable because your job's really busy and you're, you're losing sleep and you're up or whatever it is. Understanding not to squirm out of something, but to embrace into something is absolutely critical. And I don't think we get this. Maybe some of you do. I don't really. So that's why I'm preaching on it. This understanding, uh, the fruit of embracing the process of God is absolutely incredible. It really is. Some people want to go and be this, that, or the other by taking classes and doing this, that, and that's good because there is an importance of being excellent in studying and the way our world system works. If you're not studied and approved, you won't go get a job. That's a good thing. Some people bank their everything on that circumstance. Are you following me? That if I get smarter, I will have more favor. There could be some truth to that. If I get smarter and I do these things and I study it up big time, I will have more authority. Maybe. But how many of you know that demons and angels don't move on your credentials? They really don't. Hey, we know Paul, but who the heck are you? We know how in the book of Acts, it's like, we know, you think, who do you think, like, they're not moved at all by credentials. And how many of you know that the people marveled at Acts 4 because uneducated men kicked out demons and saw people and, and, and drove people and spoke people into healing in the name of Jesus and brought signs and wonders. And they weren't educated. They didn't even, like, they didn't even, they, I mean, I don't know how the education system worked back then, but I know they weren't in their big time training and anything like that. They probably did high school. Maybe not. Maybe like 16 years old, dad's like, come on out on the old fishing boat. Boy, I'm going to teach you how, what it's all about. Those were the guys that were leading the early church. You know, it wasn't, and yes, there were some smart guys involved as well as far as the credentials go, but you, Jesus picked dudes that were not chosen. You hear what I'm saying? They're chosen by God, but not by man. And understanding that process, we have to get back to the place to, to, to know if I give you this, God, this will happen. We hate delays. We hate traffic jams. We hate when some, someone else screws something up and it messes our life up. You hear what I'm talking about? Like I was on my way to the mountains and like a bus dies in the middle of the road. And I'm like, bro, you could pull over before you fully died, right? right? I sat in traffic for 40 minutes and I'm like, I didn't have a couple buttons going off. I was like, I was just ticking on the inside. And it's good because why? It shows me what's happening within me. I could actually, that's a free test that $1,000 worth of counseling, yeah. you know, can tell you, hey, you're pretty messed up, boy. I'm like, yeah, I know I was in traffic. I need to go to counseling. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you can, I appreciate counseling and pain and all that jazz. That's helpful too. But I also know sometimes we, we like need someone to tell us what God's already telling us. There's things in you, son, that I want to refine you. Let the flare of your emotions to tell you that these things aren't right. But here's the response. This is very critical. This is where most believers, in my opinion, miss it. They don't know the trade-offs. I haven't always known the trade-off. When I say yes fully, that there's a massive trade-off, that means if I say yes and there's pressure points all over and I'm like, I want to scream, kick, and yell, and God, you said your grace is sufficient, what does that even mean? Ugh, I don't feel a thing. Understanding why I say hug the trial, hug the pain, hug the adversity, because unless you fully embrace it and enroll yourself in it, you can't get the benefit of it. It's like showing up to try to get certified, and you're like, I'll just check out class once a month, maybe like, 
check it out when it's good for me. And I'll do whatever else to numb me, and hopefully, you know, people will know I went to that. How many of you know you're not going to pass the test, and your teacher's going to look at you cross-eyed and say, what are you doing? Like, you call yourself for real? You call yourself a, you're trying to be a realtor, but you didn't even, like, study, and you show up to the test, you're going to fail it every time. Well, oh, my, my family's smart, man. I'm, I think I can just look this over. It doesn't work that way. And for some odd reason, we allow circumstances and options. The television, our phones, the social media, the news, the, all the things to just keep us busy. And some of it's not even bad. But what happens, it becomes the norm of how we deal with pain and we actually stay stuck and we really don't grow. And then a year comes by and we're actually angry and frustrated and it's a crazy cycle. And I've seen it because I've done it. So I'm not, I didn't read this out of a book, I've lived it. And so how does that crazy cycle fully break and dismantle is humility Leaning on the Lord, not trusting in your own understanding, and not moving. Yeah, we know Isaiah. Wait upon the Lord. He'll renew your strength. I think we need to sit on that and actually understand waiting on the Lord might be four or five years before you move. And trust the enjoyment in the process. And so this thing, the trade-off this morning is grace. It really is. And, and grace, I'm going to read this. What is grace? <clears throat> this is good. New Testament word is, I guess, I would give those of you that speak Greek, I'm going to read here, charis or charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. It's focused on the vision of salvation. That's the meaning. I want you to say that again. It focuses on the provision of salvation. Now, all the times when we, New Testament church, here's the word salvation. Salvation is freedom, deliverance, in, in taking you, in, and how many of you know salvation can be you're delivered from a moment, not just an eternity of hell, but a moment of hell. And embracing that, that key moment. The definition of God's grace, and this is how many theologians would define it. What is grace? In the New Testament, grace means God's love in action towards men who merited the opposite of love. So when you and I threw the bird in God's face, he said, Still love my will and God's grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. How many of you know when Saul was persecuting all of humanity, essentially Christians in that moment, just straight up kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. I've got a system of thinking, everything else is wrong. God came and interrupted his sinful doing. When Paul should have burned in hell forever, God said, I will do a gift. I will release something that humanity must see. Undeserving is the death. I mean, it's the tattoo on Paul's chest if he had one. I am not deserved, which is why he constantly said, I'm the chief among sinners. I'm the most jacked up of them all. Oh, but by the grace of God. I don't think we get it. Maybe you do. And if you do, please come up and do a ministry time on it for me. But understanding this reality that the grace of God reaches down and we couldn't even lift a finger and we're so stuck in addiction and so stuck in our way of thinking and our, my mom lived like this and my dad lived like this and I'm just walking that garbage out and I pray and nothing's been broken. Oh, for the grace of God that would come and give to me something that I couldn't get in my own strength. And not just that, but it, the deliverance of salvation and not just for eternity, but for a moment. Grace means God sending his only son to descend into hell on the cross so that we guilty ones might be reconciled to God and received into heaven. God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we be made the righteousness and called the righteousness of God in him. I love this grace definition. Grace may be defined as the unmerited, undeserving, undeserving favor of God to those who are under condemnation. Not just those that are on their way to hell, but those who are stuck in sin in the moment and can't get free and just say, man, I have an attitude problem or I'm too emotional and I, I get angry when, when these things happen. I want you to put yourself into the, where are you? Where do you get your tail kicked? Oh, I'm just going to talk plain with us. Where are you losing? You might, if you're saying you're not losing, I guarantee you're losing. Because there is a, a two or three spots where you just get your, you just go through the ringer in these areas. And for some reason, you, you're like, ah, I just can't win in these areas. What is it? And I want to say that I had those areas 
and still do. Guess what? I overcame two or three of them 10 years ago in the last 10 years. And now I'm like, bro, what in the world? There's new ones. Like, why? And the Lord's just saying, I'm just finding this, refining this because my goal is to refine you and make you into the image of my son. I want you to look like Jesus and talk like him and be like him and reflect him. And when pressure comes, all you do is manifest him everywhere you go. I want your kids to bug the snot out of you in, in, in the flesh. And what people would say, how could that guy put up with that? And you manifest the father in that moment. I want when everything goes wrong around you in your job for you not to respond emotionally, but for you to respond, trust in the Lord, lean out on your own understanding in the moment and don't go back on memory lane of, wait a minute, I feel hurt right now. What's going on? And why is this like this? And I'm just going to write a book about how I, the world is so bad around me and I just, maybe I should leave ministry. We've all had those types of things or I should quit my job because I had a bad day. I get it. But those, those moments can turn into three, four seconds of temptation and not a reality where you just, where you just take the apple and eat because it feels right. Are you following me? Yeah. This is emotional. This is a hard topic. But it's really exciting when you realize the free gift of grace that, is, that releases power into your being. You know, the world's talking. I, I talk, this is kind of a cheesy analogy, but just bear with me. Eat away those Cheetos. I'm about to give them to you. The reality is, you've watched the superhero movies, it is like the, the grace of God is, is a supernatural thing that cannot be defeated when you embrace it fully. There is no demon that can be like, well, there's a real mean guy out somewhere and he's going to come and try to trick everybody and they're all going to be deceived and people are going to die and this, that, and the other. No, the grace of God says, come kill me because I'm going to live forever. The grace of God says, come hell or high water, I'm not in this for my flesh. I'm in this because I'm, I was born in spirit. I'm renewed. I will never die. You may kill me, but I will live forever. The grace of God looks at it through a God lens and not through a, I just need to feel good. I want to have my little thing over here. and just going to, you know, just my life when I retire is going to look like this. I, fine. But if it is through the lens of the grace of God and what he's called you and I to be, so that thousands and millions and billions would come into the kingdom of God and not be in hell for eternity, we might want to shake the etch sketch board up and ask them to redesign it for us. <clears throat> All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. We're moving right along. All right. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord. This is talking about the, this is verse 8, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, the thorn in Paul's side. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm having a heck of a time. Like this, whether it was a physical, I mean, there's so many different opinions on what was Paul's thorn. I'm not going to get into it. The bottom line is we got some thorns up in here, right? Y'all so y'all got some thorns up in your sides. We all do. It's like, man, that you can blame the person, blame the infirmity, blame whatever. I want to say this before I read this completely. I don't want you to take this out of, out of context. Some of you, so I've heard some people say, well, it's just my thorn. And I am here to say Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to just, ah, oh, it's just my you know, it's just the condition I have, and you know, one day I'll be free of it when I die. He didn't die on the cross for you to, to manage your pain. That would be heresy. It's an extreme statement, but it's the truth. It says that he bore our iniquities on that cross. He bore our pain, the shame, the, all of the dynamics of the human emotions. How many of you know that he wore it and he owned it? He became it on the cross. It wasn't a, ah, you know, just, just the pain there. You know? it, it wasn't just a little thing that he's like, well, you're going to deal with some of that, but I, I forgive you. And, you know, we need to suffer so we know what, like, I, I've heard the most crooked theologies. And, you know, I feel for people because well-meaning people come up with crazy theologies that say, I just, this is just part of my life. This is what I'm supposed to have. And it's not biblical because someone taught that this is just how, and I'm not bashing anyone. I, you know, I just want to be very clear. That we don't just agree. If you're agreeing that this is just something I'm supposed to suffer with until I die, 
or I did it. I'm, I did a bunch of drugs, so it's my fault back in the day, or you might have, whatever your testimony is. I caught, so the, the consequences of sin is death, and, and I'm paying for it now, and you know, God forgives me. If you have any of that thinking in your head, drop, kick it out of your head and body today. Amen. So this is not what this scripture is saying. Like, I'm just going to kind of hold on, like this is how it is. And he came to restore and make new all things. Not for us to just manage some pain and, and, and just say, you know, it's just the way it's going to be. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. This is wild. I mean, you're like, you're like hey, Paul, we just like chill out a little bit, buddy. But no, he's, he's declaring and prophesying this word. I take pleasure in the infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. I'm thinking, if, if I'm, I'm a new believer, I'm like, dude, what is going on with this guy? He's like hardcore, right? But then he says this at the very end. For Christ's sake. He does it for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. He understands there is a divine transfer. So again, Paul isn't saying, well, I'm just going to have this thorn. And man, you know, whether it was a real thorn or a circumstance or a demon that was tormenting him. The bottom line was this. I don't believe that this is how it's going to be. I'm going to choose that no matter what comes on my body and my spirit, no matter what I go through, I'm going to use it as a trampoline, as a foundation to shoot me into the presence of God rather than whine about it in the corner and say, I got to get to the next healing service and everything's just so hard and blah, 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 and God must be mad at me. And He didn't create bad theology. He embraced the prophetic spirit in that moment and realized he was to declare the truth in that moment. And what was that truth? First of all, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Which means that free gift of salvation, not just forever, but in the moment for the pain that you're going through, I'm going to deliver you. What does that look like? We don't always know, but we know it's a promise. So he never lied. So we know it's going to happen. The second thing is, is for my, like when, when we're going through the ringer, usually we're weary. But here's what he says. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So you want to know how to be strong. I want to know how to be strong. Get really weak. Don't have the answers for everything. You ever get around people and it's like everyone wants to fix everything? It's like, wait, wait, wait. What if the answer was, what's he saying? Because there's a way that seems right to the man in the end, at least to destruction. There's a way. Just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's the word of the Lord for today. It's amazing the transfer. He says, so here, therefore, most gladly. You just, I'll reword it. All right, fellas. All right, ladies. Here we go. I am beyond excited to announce today that I am pumped out of my mind that I'm that I've got that I'm sick as a dog right now. That these things are in my I'm being something's happening. But I tell you what, Christ is about to manifest in my body, and there's an expectation and a faith that the grace of God is a free gift that comes that you and I cannot earn. How many of you know that didn't, Paul didn't say oh, I'm earning this gift? You know, I you know I just positioned myself. Fasted, all these things. Oh, I've got the grace of God. We know that the grace of God, I'm not going to go too much into it, but we know that it's the free gift that delivers us from us and causes and puts a power in us for us to do something that we could never do on our own. Not from a teaching, not from a certification, not from anything. You're led by the Spirit as you perform your daily duties because you realize, oh, but for the grace of God. The trade-off is incredible if we allow it to happen. You rip the buds off too soon and the tree is budding, how many of you know you have less fruit? How many of you know, like, it's mango season coming up, and you're like, man, those suckers grow any quicker? Right? I'm like, I'm a mango guy. I've got some of the best taste of mangoes in my yard. I'll tackle you if I catch you in the middle of the night and I take them. I'm just kidding. Squirrels. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> if you thwart the process, you don't let the fruit grow. When it's truly time to pick, you might have a couple pieces. The harvest could have been hundredfold if you let it grow. If I let it grow. 
Last place I want to go is in Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Anybody ever study the, the attitudes in depth? You know, probably a few of you have gone deeper in them. And you ever read them before and you're just like, I don't know, man. I remember reading, I think I read these in high school once. And I was like, I don't even know what meek means. Um, or in spirit, it's kind of confusing. Uh, Got to be merciful to people. I want to pure in heart. I want to see God. I should be a peacemaker. And, you know, but when you don't have much understanding, you're like, you think a peacemaker means like, like peace. I'm gonna get the peace sticker on the back of my car, like, bring world peace. Like this, is how you know that's not what Jesus was teaching. Right? The eight beatitudes are the concrete of our, our the rock. I truly believe in the foundation. This is the fruit of a, of a man or a woman that lives. Embracing, this is what we get when we embrace. Because you you're not really hungry. Check this out. You're not really hungry for deliverance if you're living in the world because you're probably full on temporary band aids and little things that are just going to keep your mind busy. You're full on the ivory profile of the world, if you want to call it, just to keep you busy and settled on the inside. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This has been a probably a go-to area in my life where I've looked and what ultimately do we want under pressure is we just want to feel blessed. We want our brains to be at rest. We want, everyone wants to be blessed. We've taken the blessing teaching and we, you all know what some people have done with the blessing teaching. If you do this, God will give you that. It's all about blessing. How many of you know that blessing still is actually something God does want to give gifts. God does want to bless you and I. But we need to redefine what blessing looks like. We need to redefine because if we understand it appropriately and we embrace it, we get the full measure. The grace of God allows us to do this, be more in spirit. It allows truly, there's an aching in my spirit, a mourning, uh, uh, and it talks about mourning just right after, an aching of, God, I know that I am nothing apart from you. A mourning that I love you, but it's not okay because I want more of your presence. And then the trade-off is the kingdom of heaven. The trade-off is you will be comforted. And how many know comforted isn't just having a bad day and all of a sudden, such and such showed up with peace in a movie and it's all better now. How many know that's a big old band-aid? And now encouragement's good. You assume you're all like, don't come at me after church. It's not bad if you go show up with a meal in a movie to someone's house. That's awesome. But if it's the thing that replaces the pain, it's just replacing it. It's not truly. If you allow the encouragement to cause you to stare at God, that's one thing. You hear what I'm saying? But oftentimes we can receive the blessing wrong and not filter it through the mindset of the Holy Spirit. And all it really does is cause us to walk pain. Rather than someone stopping by your house and saying, I want to bless you, you know, whatever it might be, to cause us to say, Father, you got my attention. Right? Father, you're, you're staring at what's happening in my life. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit their. Now, I'm going to say this just really briefly. Meekness is the authority bridled. It's, it's, I always describe it as it's like the Bud, it's like the, the Clydesdale horse 
that could step on there anybody. If that sucker walked in, it's like these those things are huge, and they could just destroy a person in one minute and pounce if they wanted to. But they're subject to the bit of their owner. It goes back and forth. And so understanding if we see ourselves as a spiritual bit on the inside, Father, where, where am I going next? Who do you want me to call today? How do, Holy Spirit, what are we doing today? It's the leading of the Holy Spirit, that meekness, the promise. And I'm not going to continue. I just read these, but I want us to see the blessing that takes place. You and I will never enter into the, to these beatitudes. We really won't. Without the grace of God, because this is just good what will happen is we'll keep our band-aids on and we'll just keep going about life. And when it's convenient, we'll check it out and say, yeah, I need to have more hunger for God. Yeah, I need to. But when the grace of God comes on you, it allows you and I to do something that we could never do on our own. When the grace of God comes to take place in our lives as a free gift on a Christmas morning, I'm giving you a word picture here. And have you ever been surprised with a gift you're just uncomfortable to receive? <laughs> I, I, I'm not even really comfortable at taking this right now. Like, this is this is too much. How many of you know that's God on an everyday basis with us? If we allow that grace, that power to come in, because we see ourselves as too dirty, too frustrated, and, and oh, I did this, and I shouldn't be like that. I just, same old garbage, and we have our excuse list. And the father's like, I'm the daddy. I get to the, the love on the kid that doesn't know how to tie his shoes, but I'm pumped that he's trying. Come on. And he's saying, if you embrace this free gift, you are going to learn how to be more like my son, being conformed into his image, so that when the pressures come, it's game on. You're going to manifest Jesus in the midst of persecution and trial. When the pressure comes and everything is against you, it's him that comes out. When the pressure comes and you're tired and the Spirit speaks to you about going to talk to somebody at a, at a Walmart or whatever, you're going to stop and turn around and go talk to them. You're going to yield. Yielding is doable, not just doable. It's the only option to the spirit when the grace of God is present. But when we just kind of go about our life, I'm, you know, just is what it is, that, this, or the other, something begins to take place, and we begin to become average, if you will, if we want to call it average. We just become a believer that hears occasionally, you know, God just spoke me. Man, I think God's moving over here because this person heard the Lord. And we just bounce. And imagine if the body of believers embraced the grace of God on the treasure coast. Revival would start this afternoon. Truly would. Truly. Because why? The grace of God leads us to repentance. The grace of God causes us to get up and live wholehearted. The grace of God awakens our spiritual understanding to not live like the world. Sasha, do you want to come up? <clears throat> Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not from yourselves. This is nothing we're earning. It is the very gift of God. Not by your works, so that no one can boast. You can't. There's no, uh, I'm the man. I man, hear my sermon. Get that new song I wrote to do this. Man, I got that promotion. Check out my new house. Check out my new boat. There's no thing, nothing you can do to say, look at me. Because it is something, it's an empowerment that causes us that all of our doings and our successes point to Christ. That's why Paul says in very clearly in Philippians 3, Yo, indeed, I also count all things lost. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all rubbish. And right before it talks about he was the Jew of Jews. And he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the man, all the credentials. He says that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I want to say that again. Not having my own righteousness. Nothing good I'm bringing to the table. Which is from the law. It's the old way of doing things. I'm going to earn it. I'm going to keep the law. He says this. And the <clears throat> that which is through. It happens because of the faith aspect of being locked in embracing grace. The righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. In the fellowship 
Hugging your trials, y'all. Hugging it. Grabbing onto it. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death. Just when you think it's hard. Your whole being, letting your, 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 your sin nature die with him, as it says in Romans. Being conformed to his death. If by any means I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to read this briefly from Acts 17. And he had made me, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. This is Acts 17, 26 and 27. And has determined in their pre-appointed times at the boundaries of their dwellings so they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him. That's an intense word. And find him, though he is not far from each of us. I know that word grope, you might think, what is he trying to There is, just give me him, let me grab his arm and not let go. Just like the woman bled, if I only touched the outer garment, power would be released through me. Jesus, we, we see that dunamis power is released. And in one moment, she's healed. Because there was a groping. There was a give me him. I just let, he can drag me through the, through the walkway. I'm not leading until I'm different, until I'm healed. Because she saw something in him that said, I must have him. How many of you know, as we read it, those who hunger and those who thirst for righteousness shall be filled. You never, he never disappoints. But if we're not hungry and thirsty, we take a sip here and there, we'll probably receive the nutrients at which we drink, drink and eat from that moment. So Lord, I ask right now, this morning, that you would release a supernatural grace upon our spirit to say yes. I thank you that every one of us longs for an inner peace, that you put that in our heart to live in peace. And I thank you that the circumstances and the squeezings around us don't have to define the peace that's within us. And I thank you, God, it's your goal in life to make us like your son. And I pray this morning that we wouldn't kick and scream anymore. That we would embrace that every circumstance is put in our place. That we would be conformed to the likeness of your son. That as we embrace the process of God, Lord, I ask that the trade-off this morning, that we would truly see the grace of God as the trade-off of saying no to our emotions when they are, when they are rooted in self. As we resist the flesh and say yes to the spirit. That the devil would flee and that you would draw near and release the free gift of grace that would empower us to overcome sin instead of stay in it. And I pray this morning over every mind in here, including myself, and I ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, even those that are watching this morning, I pray for renewal of thinking. Where thinking is crooked, where thinking is about self, where we're self-preserved, where we're just doing it our way. Because that's what we've learned, and we've learned the process. Any bit of Pharisee style living that says, you know, I learned that when I was in youth group back in the day, and I'm going to trust God, and I got my systems down, and this and that and the other. Lord, I pray that you would transform us into the likeness of your Son. I ask that we would be crucified with Christ, not just a cute phrase we learn. That no longer we would live for self. But Christ would live in us. That this life that we live, we would live fully for you. In the flesh, but fully for the Son of God. Who loves us and gave himself for us. So let the grace of God rule this morning, Jesus. When we embrace the trial, the pressure, the pain, we actually gain Christ. We get the full blessing of grace. Empowerment to manifest Christ. Trade-off is incredible. What we know in our head, Lord, I ask that you bring it into our heart this morning. And I pray for supernatural power called grace. To be released on all of us right now. In the name of Jesus. 
I just pray for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit over our lives. And just declare, be filled this morning afresh in Jesus' name. For every spirit to be awakened. For every heart to be made alive. God, I ask that you would put a spiritual hunger in us that we didn't even know was capable. I ask that you pull the plug of all of our vices. Of anything that drinking from the world. That your love, as it says in Song of Solomon 1, is better than wine. The better than the wine of this world. That your love outsurpasses any pleasure that we could get from the world. And I ask God, where we feel barren and dormant, I ask right now over all of our hearts, breathe, O oh breath of God. Breathe the free gift of grace where we feel trapped. Any place where those feel alone, feel rejected, I ask, stir up the waters. And there are areas where the heart is not like flesh that is like stone right now, God. I ask that you begin to palpate the heart this morning with your, your hand. Go right to the deepest, darkest parts, God, where the do not enter sign exists in every single one of us, Lord. And I pray, breathe the blood of Jesus back into our hearts where we're dead. Awaken, I just declare it in every single person this morning. Awaken. Breathe again, Jesus. Breathe again. Take us back to where it hurts or we decided I will shut down in that area because that's just not me. It was too painful. And I pray for any excuse that would linger in our spirit, man, this morning about living full, fully given to you. Where the areas we've been wounded and the unforgiveness and any bitterness that would linger. I pray for forgiveness to reign. Trading off bitterness and anger for the grace of God to empower us. Well, Chris, the situation is too hard. I hated that situation. I don't want to go back there. It torments me. I thank you that the grace of God can take us anywhere in Christ Jesus. I thank you that we can visit the deepest, darkest memories. And you're right there because there's no getting away from your spirit. Even there, the darkest moments, your right hand is with us. You're holding us. Take us there right now where the, the hardest parts of the grace of God transcend into the darkest waters where we never want to go ever again, Lord. The areas of pain. I ask that you would visit and wash clean memories, Lord. Clean conscience, Lord, across this place this morning because you're worthy of a full heart given to you. I don't want to give 75% because these few areas shut me down. I don't know what to do. And I set up some fortresses around it to just protect me. And if people don't get too close to me there, I'll be fine. But those few spots, they really hurt. Lord, I ask this morning, rip the fortress down in the name of Jesus. Rip the fortresses down that we built to live self-sustained with no Christ manifested in those areas. A heart that's fully burning. Some of you have prayed that and you've asked, Lord, come. I want a heart that burns. And he's saying, I want to come, but the fortresses still stand. So this morning, I give you the key to the fortress, Lord. And I say, come and open it. I don't even have the strength to let it go, but I give it to you. Just do that with him this morning. And maybe he's not highlighting any walls right now. That's fine. But I encourage you to ask him for the full-blown grace of God, that anointing to say yes to him. To receive that power that empowers you to walk out. To embrace the infirmity. To embrace whatever be around you and say, come hell or high water. I will rejoice. My song will be louder than the trial before me. And I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the deliverance of who he is. And manifest in my family's life. In my marriage. In my children. And my grandchildren and my job and to those you send before me, God, I want to be a burning and shining torch like a city on a hill. I'm done with putting a little cap over my light because I'm too scared of this, that and the other. Lord, we take our excuses this morning and we release them at your feet and we ask, take them for us. Here's the key this morning, Lord. Open it up and clean our house and fill us this morning with your spirit, Jesus.
I'm going to leave us with this. I just feel like I need to say this this morning. <clears throat> Some of you, this is going to resonate. I said a lot this morning. Summarizing it, let the grace of God empower you to take you where you don't want to go. There is no possible way a human being could lay their life down for a savior, be a martyr without the grace of God. So that's the extreme version of grace, of power to, to say yes unto death. But I encourage you, let the grace of God to take you, take you places now where you don't want to go. To deal with stuff you don't want to deal with. And to say yes in such a way you've never said yes before. But I will say this, that some of us in this room, I just feel this very strongly, are being invited into being transparent like you've never before. The reason you are stuck is because you are you are not transparent. I don't know who this is for, but you're just you don't want to talk about your issues. And you're gonna stay stuck because he longs to us to be with to be in family. He just wants us to be a big family. I'm not saying you got to go throw your pearls on Facebook Live and tell the world what's happening. I'm just talking about perhaps some people around you that you know trust, that you trust, and be family, get them close, and just say, I need you to pray for you. I assure you that the humble heart will be saved. If we humble ourselves in the eyes of the Lord, he will lift us up. And just, and also too, I, I get a clear picture. Some of us are going to go back 10, 20, 30 years ago, maybe even five years ago, whatever, it might be last month, unlock the door of your greatest fears and let it out. That's where it comes with transparency. Some of them, if that person found out this about my life, they would think I'm crazy. Tell them that. Because you got nothing to hide in Christ Jesus. Because it's all been made new. There's no, there's no hiding place in it because why? He already knows about it. And he's not there whipping you in the back saying you're a sinner and you can't believe you did that. Because where shame exists, Christ can't be. Do you know that? He's there, but he doesn't have preeminence in that place of your life. If there is shame that's active and alive, you will live. Based on the percentage of shame that's alive, you will give God the other percentage. I don't know about you. I lived. I was addicted to shame. And I beat myself up all the time for years, 10, 10 12, 13 years ago. The moment I started talking about the lies that were in my head and working through, and I didn't hold anything back, hey, when a thought comes into my head and wants to accuse me of this, that, and the other, have fun. I look at it now, because you're going to encounter the blood of Jesus, baby. You want to accuse me of this, that, and the other? You want to tell me that I'm this or that? When you know who you are, the thoughts that come into your head don't that aren't of him don't affect you, unless you doubt that it's real. Are you following me? So today, I don't think this might be for one of y'all, might be for everyone. I mean, I think we all have areas, but ask the Holy Spirit, take me to where it hurts, because I was meant to give my heart fully to you. Amen? Lord, I pray as we go today for that empowerment to be upon us. You're incredible in your grace and in your mercy of how you do things. When we deserve hell, you actually intercept our wicked ways, and then you celebrate our salvation. When, when you should punish us, you give us mercy. And then you give us grace to reinstate us back into the game. It's incredible, the grace of God, the mercy of God that knows no limits. And I pray for Fort Pierce <coughs> this morning. And I pray for Vero Beach and Okeechobee and Jensen Beach. Palm City and Stewart, Lord, for the entire Treasure Coast, Port St. Lucie, we ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit to be awakened upon every single person this morning, whether they're in church or not, God. I ask that there would be a current of the activity of the Spirit upon hearts, where husbands and wives look at each other and are just thinking, Monday's coming and I don't want to do this marriage anymore. God, I ask that you'd release angels in the households today to reinstate people that don't deserve to be reinstated, to put a new hope and a fresh peace where those are bound in addiction and can't get out of it, those that hate themselves and are, think they're worthless. I thank you that those are the ones you pick, Lord. And I ask for the rich, the poor, and the middle class this morning. And as we leave, I ask for the grace of God to sweep through the treasure coast and bring salvation. Bring deliverance, Lord Jesus. 
to those that think they don't even need it, Lord, at this morning, that in one moment they would see they do. And I pray for face-to-face -face encounters today, for dreams in the night, for shakings, God, the fear of the Lord that is calm and is full of peace. It might rattle our bones, but it brings salvation, Lord. Let, us, let it rest upon us as we go today. In our neighborhoods, in, our, in the school systems, in the locker rooms, God, all across this coast. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have an announcement. And if we didn't take an offering, so you can put it in the back on the, uh, we have a little box. You can just drop it in before you go. So love you all. We'll see you this week.